So this morning, I'm reading, like I always do, on the Jerusalem Post, Times of Israel, Israel National News, and Detka.com. And I see several articles. I'm going to read them one by one, and you're going to, you're going to understand that Israel knows that the big war is about to commence. Israel knows, looks to me like Israel knows that Ezekiel 38 and 39 is about to take place. So I'm going to go ahead and start with the one on Debka.com, Moscow distorts 1974 Golan disengagement deal invoked by Israel. It's very short. Russia media Sunday responded to Israel's invocation of its 1974 disengagement agreement with Syria to accommodate Syrian refugees by misreading it as meaning Israel wants only a pro-Assad troops wants only pro-Assad troops to enter into the conflict zone near Israel's de facto northern border and take over take it over at the border. The historic 1974 agreement mandated Syria's military withdrawal from the disengagement zone. It was not a license to cross in. Of course, as I reported to on this uh, channel yesterday, that the Syrians were entering the abandoned UN post in the DMZ zone. So it was not a license to cross in as the Russians are pretending. Moscow hides the fact that both signatories, Israel and Syria, agreed that the only force permitted to enter the zone is the UNDOF, and this deal held up for decades until the outbreak of the Syrian civil war. <clears throat> Moscow, moreover, chooses to pretend that Israel's northern border is only de facto. Can you smell it? Stinks, doesn't it? it smells rotten. You know what's going on. We all are capable of thinking logically. Okay. So, in another article, Debka.com, posted today, IDF boosts Golan lines with tank, artillery, rocket units, and marks out security zones. This article is a little bit longer. The IDF Northern Command Sunday, July 1st, upgraded the preparedness of the Golan Basin Division with tanks, artillery, and rocket units after evaluating the level of fighting on the Syrian side of the border. This was announced by the military spokesman. His announcement went on to stress that the high importance of the IDF attaches to the maintaining of the disengagement of forces agreement on the Golan concluded in 1974 by Israel and Syria. He added, Israel abides by a policy of non-involvement in Syrian affairs along with a firm response to violations of its sovereignty and possible harm to its citizens. Debka file adds, this statement provides advance notice that Israel will not tolerate the entry of Hezbollah and pro-Iranian Shiite forces to the Kunertra region opposite IDF Golan lines and further emphasizes non-acceptance of their entry into the historic disengagement zone between Kenetra and the Israeli border. While boosting its defensive stance on the Golan, Israel, by this statement, marks out a security zone based on the 1974 disengagement lines for accommodating the tens of thousands of Syrian refugees massing on its border as well as the rebel forces 
retreating from Cunetra. This zone covers 235 square kilometers between southern Golan and Mount Hermon. It is inside the disengagement line which runs east of the Israeli border and it is between a few meters wide at the Nahal Rokid on the southern Golan up to six kilometers broad at its northern tip and widens out to 10 kilometers on Mount Hermon. The question is whether the Russian and, is, and Syrian forces taking part in the southwestern Syrian offensive will honor the security zone Israel has marked out when the objective of their current offensive is to restore Syrian government authority to all the southern border regions. Opening the Sunday cabinet session in Jerusalem, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said, we shall persist in defending our borders and extending humanitarian aid, but will not allow anyone to step across into our territory. I am in constant contact with the Kremlin and the White House on this question. On Saturday, the IDF transferred six injured Syrians, four of them children, whose parents were killed in the fighting to Israel hospitals for treatment. So that's the end of that article. You see the trend here. You see what's happening now, a cry for help from two Israeli statesmen. Now, before people start laughing this off because of who wrote it, I would suggest to not laugh it off because of who wrote it. Here's what I mean. Moshe Ya'elon and Yair Lapid are not very strong and in the so-called Israeli right-wing circles they they're not fans of these two guys is what I'm saying. But what I'm saying, what I'm also saying is, when you read this letter to the world, to the United States, from these two men, you know that it is a cry for help. That is that it appears that a great conflagration on the northern border with Israel is imminent. So I'm going to go ahead and read it. And the title is, Will the West Cede the Golan Heights to a Psychopath? This is on the Times of Israel. Once again, today. We live in a world full of complex diplomatic dilemmas, but for once, here is a simple one. Would you take an area that is flourishing in a Western democratic state where 50,000 people of different religions and ethnicities live in harmony and hand it over to a violent dictatorship ruled by the worst mass murderer of our time so that he can destroy the area and murder most of the residents. If your answer is no, then you support recognizing Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights. Let me stop for a minute. Folks, please listen to every word in this article. No matter what you think about these two men, they are right on point here. In 1981, Israel applied its law to the Golan Heights. The Syrians insisted it be returned to them. Most countries, including the United States, have avoided taking a clear position. We believe it's time to get off the fence. Well, Mr. Ya'elon and uh, Mr. Lapid, I agree. The Golan Heights is a unique story in the Israeli-Arab conflict. It's a mountainous region about 1,155 square miles around the size of a medium-sized ranch in Texas. Let me interject here. How many times have we read about the Golan Heights 
uh, or about, um, yes, about the Golan Heights in Ezekiel 38 and 39. And I have pointed out that you cannot get the entire army, the Russian army in there. You can't get the way King James Bible described the situation. It made it look like that the whole army of Gog and Magog was going to be in the Golan Heights. You're not going to, you can't put it, you can't get them in there. There is going to, there is going to be a great army coming in there, but not as great as King James would like you to believe. King James Version, I will continue. Uh, 155,000 square miles around the size of a medium-sized ranch in Texas in the north of Israel. It's worth noting, of course, that it is entirely unrelated to Israel's conflict with the Palestinians. Not a single Palestinian lives in the Golan Heights. Historically, the Golan is known as the Biblical Land of Bashan, from the book of Deuteronomy. Just recently, a major renovation of a 4th century Jewish synagogue was completed, and in archaeological excavations, a coin from 67 CE, or as the West says, 67 AD, was discovered with an inscription which read, For the redemption of Jerusalem, the Holy. Jerusalem is the holy place. It is an area of a long and deep Jewish connection. The Syrians, on the other hand, ruled over the Golan Heights for only 21 years, between the years of 1946 and 1967. <laughs> During those years, they turned the Golan into a military base, rained rocket fire on the Israeli communities which are under the Golan Heights and try to divert Israel's critical water source to dry the country out. In 1967, during the Six-Day War, the Golan Heights was liberated by Israel. In the 51 years since Israel developed the Golan Heights and turned it into an impressive center of nature reserves, tourism, and high-tech agriculture, award-winning wines, flourishing food tech industry, and in-demand boutique hotels, and I'm going to add, me personally, I'm going to add cattle. Lots of cattle. And in-demand boutique hotels, the Druze populations of the Golan Heights, who made up about half the population, were granted all the same rights as any other Israeli citizen, as would have been done in any genuine democracy. On the other side of the border, life went into the other direction. In the past seven years, President Assad has massacred over a half a million of his own people, and his actions led to the displacement of 11 million more. He left the Ir Iranian Revolutionary Guards and Hezbollah, the largest terror organizations in the world, into Syria. He encouraged Shia militias from Iraq and elsewhere to flood into Syria. It is a dark regime led by a psychopath, listen very carefully to these next words, supported by the most malevolent forces on the earth today. Who do you think these two are speaking of? Who is Bashar Assad supported by? Who is who are these two men calling the most malevolent forces on the earth today? The, po the folks who are supporting Bashar Assad? You know who they are. I know who they are. The man who didn't hesitate to use chemical weapons against women and children continued to demand the Golan Heights in the name of international law. The fact that anyone in the Western world still takes that argument seriously is worse than naivety. It is insanity. I, it is not only insanity. It is absolute rebellion against the power of heaven. How about that? Does his monstrous behavior have no cost? Do we live in a world without any sense of reward and punishment? The fact that the Golan Heights is under Israeli rule is the only thing 
that saved it from the Syrian Valley of Death, which is collapsing under the weight of violence and destruction. The international community led by the United States need to do the simple thing. To announce that they see the world as it is. We call on the American administration in both parties, Republicans and Democrats, to lead an international process of recognition of Israeli sovereignty over the Golan Heights. It is historically just. It is strategically smart and will allow the United States to exact extract a price from Assad for his despicable behavior without putting boots on the ground in Syria. Unfortunately, unfortunately, the Democrats and the Republicans are now in a civil war in the United States. The government of the United States has no time for Israel anymore. If you have watched what's been going on within the United States with the FBI, the executive branch, the legislative branch, you it's obvious that there's a civil war going on here. The shooting just hasn't started yet. And for Lieutenant General Moshe Yalon and for M.K. Yar Lapid to have to say this, what they're essentially saying is, United States, wake up out of your stupor. And again, Debka.com in a previous article appears to insinuate that the summit in July the 16th between President Donald Trump and President Vladimir Putin will be too late. I'm beginning to wonder that myself. This article in the Times of Israel by these two statesmen this article is a cry for help. Just in case, so for you two statesmen, I know you're not listening to me, but in case you do, remember this, there is somebody listening. The greatest power of heaven is listening. And Israel's redemption is about to take place before our very eyes in a way that's going to shape the nations down to their ruin. Israel, all Israel, including those who have Jewish genes on their father's side, will all be brought back. None are going to be left behind, as it says in Ezekiel 39. Not one is going to be left behind. Zion will rise, and the world is going to fall. It's just that simple. Israel will gain the real estate, all of the real estate that was written about in Joshua 1, verses 1 through 4, and then some. In fact, Jerusalem, how do I put this? Israel, instead of Jerusalem being inside of Israel, Israel will be inside of Jerusalem, you see, because Jerusalem is going to be the name of that real estate 
that I've just spoken about. And within the walls of Jerusalem is going to be Israel, all 12 tribes. <clears throat> so hopefully those who are listening, and there'll be very few, are paying attention to the Golan Heights because that's where the trigger is going to be pulled. And, and uh, Zechariah 13, I believe it is, uh, Jehovah is going to show his face and draw his sword, draw his bow and his arrow, Judah and Ephraim, and there will be a great war. It will be in Syria. Because it is written, I believe it's uh, Ze uh, Zechariah 13. Ah, uh, wait a minute. Maybe it's Zechariah 12? I should have been more prepared. Zechariah 14. Did I have to do a search? <clears throat> oh, Zechariah 9. Zechariah 9, it says, if you, if you read the whole chapter and then read verse 1 again, you realize that the day of Jehovah's wrath, when he appears, when Messiah appears, is going to be during the time when the land of Aram, the city of Damascus, is receiving its burden of the word of Jehovah, which is a dispersion of the peoples. And that's what's happening right now. That is the time. Let's not get caught up in the idea, well, I haven't heard the first trumpet sound yet. There is something to be said concerning the trumpets. One thing I noticed this morning was that Paul only mentioned one trumpet, the last trumpet. Interesting, huh? Let me show you something. It's in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 52. On the last trumpet, for the trumpet shall sound and the dead shall be raised. Okay? Now John says something very similar in the book of Revelation. Revelation 10, verse 7. I find this interesting, pinning these two scriptures together. And it says, But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound the mystery of Jehovah, should be finished as he declared to his servants the prophets. Now the word finished, let's make sure that we don't misinterpret that word. Accomplish, end, pay, fulfill. 
Now, we like to use the word fulfill. So let's use that word. Okay? And it slightly changes the color of the sentence. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of Jehovah should be fulfilled. As he has declared to his servants the prophets. Okay. Are you saying then that Ezekiel 38 and 39 are going to be fulfilled? At the time of the seventh trumpet? That's what John is implying here. That's what he is implying. Check this one out. Joel 2. Now we know that the day of Jehovah's wrath are the seven vials being poured out upon the Gentiles. But when we go to um, Joel 2, And it shall come to, to verse 28. And it shall come to pass afterward. After what? That's after uh, Israel's tribulation is finished. After those days that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. That's all Israel. That is written in Ezekiel 39 in the last part. He says, because I'm going to pour out my spirit upon them. Okay? Okay. That's the promise that's written. That's, that's what's written in um, Revelation 10 and verse 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, he shall begin to sound the mystery of Jehovah should be fulfilled as he has declared to his servants the prophets. What does it say in Ezekiel 39. Let's look. His servants of prophets. That includes Ezekiel. What is the biggest promise of all? What is the biggest promise of all in Ezekiel 39? Here it is. It is verse 29. The last verse. Neither will I hide my face anymore from them. From who? If you read the whole chapter, it is very clearly talking about Israel. The tribes of Israel. Neither will I hide my face anymore from them, for I have poured out my spirit upon what? The house of Israel, saith Jehovah. So when is this going to be fulfilled? Seventh trumpet. That's what John says. So then, let's go back to Joel. And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions, and upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days. What day? Seventh trumpet. Or the days when the seventh trumpet begins to sound exactly like John said. Not on the tail end, but the days when it begins to sound. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood, fire, and pillars of smoke, and the sun will be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of Jehovah's wrath come. And it shall come to pass that whomsoever shall call upon the name of Jehovah, not the Lord, 
Jehovah shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance. So in order to get deliverance, you have to go to Mount Zion and Jerusalem. You see, as Jehovah has said, and in that generation, that last generation whom he shall call. So then begs the question, is the sixth seal also the sixth trumpet? Why do I ask that question? Look, as I have pointed out many times, what's described in the sixth seal is exactly what's described in Joel 2. I watched as he opened the sixth seal, Revelation 6, verse 12. And lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth. Even as a fig tree cast away her untimely figs, as she is shaken with a mighty wind, and the heaven departed as a scroll when it is rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And the kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man hid themselves in the dens, and in the rocks, and in the mountains, and said to the mountains and the rocks, Fall upon us, and hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb, for his great day of wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? This is the same time when Israel is given the Holy Spirit. Or it is right around, remember what John said in the when the seventh trump, angel with a seven trump, begins to sound. Okay. That's when all the mysteries are going to be. And what do we have here in Revelation 7 and verse 1? And after these things I saw four angels standing upon the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel sending from the east, having the seal of the living Elohim. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, for whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the tree, uh, trees, until we have sealed the servants of our Elohim in their foreheads. So what we see here is, first of all, the 144,000 gathered up, and then we see the great multitude, the multitude of Israel that was scattered into all nations and then gathered from all the nations. Verse 9, Then I, after this I beheld a little great multitude, which no man could number of all nations, kindreds and peoples and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb. Well, you see, folks, who was taken out of great tribulation? It is a time of Jacob's trouble. But he will be saved out of it. So who is saved out of great tribulation? Israel. What does it say right here in verse 14? And I said to her, who are these? Well, uh, verse 13, one of the elders came and said, what are these who are to arrayed in white robes? And where did they come from? And I said unto him, sir, you know. And he said to me, these are they which came out of great tribulation and have washed the robes and made, made them white in the blood of the lamb. How did they do that? Well, the Messiah came to save them. And they pledged their allegiance to him. That's how. They were gathered up. So, it appears, that it appears to me that this is right here. Verses, uh, Revelation, Revelation 9 through 17 is the fulfillment that was written about in Revelation Um. Verse 7, but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, 
when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of Jehovah should be finished as he declared to his servants the prophets. So it does appear that the seventh seal and the seventh trumpet are the same. Because what you see in the seventh seal is the fulfillment of the promise that was given to Ezekiel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Amos, all of them. Isn't that something? And that's why. That's why Paul focuses on the seventh trump. That's why John focuses on the seventh trump. If they do, so should we. So it appears, it appears that the great war on the Golan Heights, when Jehovah shows himself to all mankind, takes place right at, right around the sixth seal, sixth trumpet, and the gathering in of all these Israelites that were scattered into all nations, they will be gathered out of all nations, and they will have as representation the 12,000 out of each tribe, and they will be gathered around the throne of Jehovah in, in where? In Jerusalem. That is the fulfillment of the prophets. So therefore, that is the seventh trumpet. 